Okay, conservation of biodiversity. Um, so we're going to want to conserve biodiversity, maybe for some different reasons. Maybe we want to conserve biodiversity so we actually can use the materials so we can keep using the food sources and the medicinal resources. Maybe we want to conserve biodiversity because we love the recreation and the beauty of it uh, because of the inspiration we get from it. Maybe we want to conserve biodiversity because we want it to help control the air quality and help with pollination and maintain soil fertility. Lots of different reasons. Um, the arguments given for conservation will really depend on your environmental value system, right? So if you're a technocentric, you might want to conserve biodiversity so that we can actually use it. Um, maybe there's, a, you know, medicines out there that we've never discovered before. If you're an anthropocentric, maybe you want to conserve biodiversity um, so that will help support human systems. So it'll make cleaner uh, air for people to breathe so we can still have resources for people to use. And if you're ecocentric, maybe you just want to conserve biodiversity because it has an intrinsic right to exist. Um, so there's lots of different approaches to conserving biodiversity. Um, each has their own strengths and limitations. Um, so some arguments um, for preservation might take aesthetic reasons for beauty and inspiration. They might be ecological, maybe they play an important role in the ecosystem, maybe they're a keystone species, maybe they help with pollination. Um, they could be economic reasons, maybe we want to do it for ecotourism or to find medicine, um, etc. Uh, maybe they're just straight up ethical, maybe you recognize that all species have an equal right to live. Maybe there's intrinsic value there. Um, or maybe it could be social, right? So it could provide homes, work, resources, and social cohesion uh, for indigenous folks still living with the environment. Um, so we have different groups that will deal with conservation. Um, we could have international organizations, governmental organizations, and non-governmental organizations. Um, and they'll have different levels of effectiveness using media, speed of response, um, and then diplomatic constraints, financial resources, political influence. Um, of course, probably you've seen this classic logo of the WWF, which uses the panda bear because it's so charismatic. Everyone loves a panda. We love to save them. Uh, let's see. So the IUCN Red List would be another organization um, which is, is describing the conservation status of many different organisms. Um, and then some of them might leverage their resources to maximize the effectiveness of conservation efforts. Others might get less bang for their buck. Um, so sometimes, you know, they might actually support the people that run the organization more than the people that actually need it. That can be a criticism of, of many nonprofits, especially the larger nonprofits tend to have a lot of money that just goes into like running the business and, and less money for actually what they say they do. Um, so CITES is a very important one to remember, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. This is, of course, all about international trade of endangered species. Um, this law made it uh, illegal to, to actually transport animals or any animal product in between nations. Whereas before, each country would have to make their own laws. Now we have laws that work between different countries. Um, and you can see when different bans were placed for different um, species, you know, bans on rhino horn trading and then ivory from African elephants and then painted dogs, pangolins. Um, they think pangolin might have been the connection between the coronavirus epidemic, actually. Um, it's viewed as like a, you know, traditional medicine sort of delicacy in, in some cultures, even though pangolins are highly endangered. Um, so two, uh, I guess, three major approaches to conservation would be habitat approach. So we're focusing on protecting the habitats of areas, um, trying to preserve land and land area. This is considered in situ conservation because it is in site, on site. We're doing it on the location where the animals live. Uh, the opposite would be the species approach um, where we're focusing on um, an individual species. This will often include ex situ or off site efforts like captive breeding, um, raising them in zoos, reintroducing them into the wild like we reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone. Um, this will be more of a focus on keystone species because um, they think if we save those keystone species, it could affect lots of other things. Whereas habitat based approach would be more like protecting lots of different species. Um, but ideally, we'd like to use sort of a mixture of the two, right, where we are conserving some natural reserves and natural areas, 
uh, while also trying to work with uh, critically endangered species to restore their numbers. You can't really have one of these without the other. Um, it's not really going to work. Um, so when we design some protected areas, we take some, some things into effect. So generally large areas are better than small areas. They have more habitats, more species, more niches, more varied, um, less edge effect. So the edge effect will affect um, some, some organisms like to live really far away from, from edges. Other organisms actually enjoy having those sort of edges. So, so things like coyotes actually do better um, with more edges, so, you know, grasslands on forest edge, um, suburban areas to like a wild area. Um, whereas animals like wolves, they need larger impact resources. So that's actually why the population of coyotes has gone up in the nation while the population of wolves has gone down. Um, the shape and the corridors and proximity of, of habitats can also affect it. So ideally we wanna have like a really uh, intact whole system. Um, and then if we, you know, have um, kind of a weirder shape like this, then you have a harder chance of getting between these two areas. Um, and then ideally, if you do have separated patches, you'd want to have some kind of corridors in between so animals can go between them. Um, yeah, so CITES uh, is a voluntary international agreement. So it's not always the most consistent of enforcement. Um, and then there's actually different degrees of protection. So some animals are very highly protected. Some of them are less protected. Um, ultimately, we're limiting trade, though actually they do sometimes allow some trade. So they've actually allowed some sales of ivory through this. And so you might ask, is it actually worth selling that ivory? Um, or is that still driving up the demand for ivory, et cetera? Um, so here we see some um, some captive breeding in zoos, some ex situ conservation, species based conservation. Um, these condor chicks um, are fed by a condor puppet, so they um, don't imprint on humans. Basically, the first thing a baby sees, it thinks it's its parent, so they want to make sure that it thinks a condor is its parent. Um, without this species based conservation, we probably would have totally lost condors. There were less than a dozen condors worldwide at one point, and they captured all of them from the wild. And they started doing a really intensive breeding program in zoos. And now we've rebounded to a couple hundred condors in the wild. Um, we could reintroduce species. Um, so here you see uh, the Arabian oryx in Abu Dubai um, being released. Uh, the California condor was also re-released into the wild. Um, and also the wolves in Yellowstone were, were um, repatriated, basically reintroduced into ecosystems. Um, so flagship species or charismatic species are going to be the cute, cuddly ones, usually large mammals at the top of food chains. Um, not to be confused with keystone species. These ones are just sort of appealing because of, of their cuteness and everything, whereas keystone species are actually going to have an impact on the environment. They'll keep food webs intact. They'll provide some niches. They'll actually totally change ecosystems sometimes with trophic cascades. Um, we could have um, different levels of funding and, and community support, which would affect the uh, success of conservation. Um, so more support from the public and locals will lead to better conservation. And this is a lot of times how the human aspect will connect with the natural world. If you have humans that are needing a lot of resources, they might be less inclined to conserve the natural environment. So if you can kind of make a combination of, say, like ecotourism with a national park, then you provide jobs and also provide conservation at the same time. Um, yeah, so the location of a conserva conservation area is also a huge um, impact. So we wanna be generally further from urban centers to be a little bit more protected from people, from disturbance, et cetera. Um, so example style questions, explain, explain the criteria used to design uh, or manage a protected area, evaluate the success of a given area, Evaluate different approaches to protecting uh, approaches to protecting biodiversity. So habitat versus species based versus a mixed approach. And then once again, you can find the link to this in the description.